traditional Chinese places. But you know, I think it's part of the beauty communities to like Musi Bee right now. <laughs> so you guys, unfortunately, I can't give it to you guys over the camera. It's Ashley. Ashley. So yeah, yeah, no, it's a, and yeah, great point because all that beef and broccoli and, and, and general so chicken, yeah, not the most traditional food, but it's still delicious. Needless, needless to say, you know. Absolutely. And you, you were a San Francisco native, so you grew up. You went to Lowell High School, but. You also had, you know, kind of an interesting career path because you went to culinary school and got formal training in New York, but then you also went and served in the Marine Corps, I think. And so, what? Tell me about kind of how, like, why did you get into the restaurant business? Because I think, you know, it's such a, it's kind of a funny story to tell. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so on that, note, yeah, I, I graduated from Lowell. I have no idea how I graduated from Lowell. I uh, <laughs> definitely wasn't the greatest student, but after. Well, I kind of just ran away to New York, you know, like most most kids that just didn't have the most healthy relationships with their parents. And from that point on, um, I didn't really want to do anything else. Like I, I, I initially tried joining the Marine Corps at seventeen, but my mom was like, "Hell no, you're not, you're not going." So I kind of promised her a degree, and culinary arts was kind of the only thing that I wanted to do aside from uh, joining the military. And so I ran away to New York, uh, got some, like you said, some formal training in in um, at the at the CIA in Hyde Park, New York, and then got some various experiences throughout my undergrad there, and uh, from nice you know fine dining establishments to yacht clubs and country clubs. So it was great. Once I graduated, you know the itch was still there, so I immediately just enlisted and, and, and was able to do six years in the Marine Corps, uh, wow. two specifically in the reserves. And uh, when I when I moved back in 2012. Um, you know, I was just kind of figuring out my my choices and just got a desk job and figured out I didn't really enjoy it at all. And um, at that point on, I decided to try to do some pop ups and try to pop ups and try to figure out how to open a restaurant. And then yeah. linked up with one of my, one of my best friends from from high school, and he wanted a ball. Yeah, how? But it's kind of it's kind of funny though, but. You you said you mentioned that um, you had a certain experience with with um, the food that your parents cooked, and it sort of spurred you on to wanting to pursue a different way of cooking, right? Yeah, like I wish I had one of those stories, like you see on, you know, the mind of a chef, or, or you know, or any kind of like cooking show where, like, my dad took me hunting, or my mom, you know, had a nice garden where she had fresh herbs on her too. It's that wasn't the fact. Like my parents were not the worst cooks, but you know, I don't think they knew what salt was, and it was just very, very bland. And I kind of knew that if or when I decided to have a family, I, I didn't want to do that to my kids. You know, and I just remember my first experience of going to a friend's house and actually having, you know, authentic Mexican food for the first time. And I was like, oh, what's what's this taste? I've never had it. And it was mainly just salt. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so that's the main thing. Do you, um, when you were serving in the military, so you were there for six years, you know, I'm sure they they probably had food, but maybe not the things that you always craved or wanted to have. What was the one thing that you missed the most when you were serving in the military? The one food that you really wanted to have? So I just want to caveat that I, I was not a cook in the Marine Corps. Like it, that's the worst job ever. Okay, so I just want to put that into perspective. All right, so yeah, you're right. Like in, in terms of when I was uh, overseas and actually just you know in the field in general. Anytime I came home to San Francisco, uh, it would be a burrito from Taqueria Farlito, specifically <laughs> yeah. um, a nice bowl of pho is another thing that then whenever I was able to get off base, that'd be one thing that, you know, very comforting. Yeah. Um, if I had money, then, you know, House of Prime Rib would be mm. something that I need the most, specifically from, from the Bay Area. In New York, it's, it's the bagels and the pizza. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I like it all <laughs> for the most part. So... So what are you making for us today? So today I'm actually making my spin on a traditional southern dish, which is gumbo. Yeah. So I'm not going to make a traditional gumbo because I think we all know, especially being you know, Asian-American, like in the realms of like pho or, or, or anything else that like people make, every, everybody's mom and auntie makes the best one. You're, you're not going to change your mind. So this <laughs> is my spin on a southern dish. And what we do is we incorporate some... Um, Southeast Asian, East Asian flavors to it. So you want to just kind of go in. Um, these are some of the ingredients that we're going to be utilizing today. 
So what do you have here, Jeremy? What does it look like? Yeah, so first things first, we have this thing that's called like a, which is like Holy Trinity. Okay, so you have onions, celery, and green bell peppers. We added a little bit of red bell peppers just for a little bit more flavor. Okay, so this is kind of the basis of, you know, the, in a way kind of the mirror plot of it all. Yeah, you call it the Holy Trinity? Yeah, that's what they call it uh, in, in Louisiana. Uh, in a lot of traditional Creole dishes, that's kind of like what they put in everything. Kind of, in a way, like a generic term for Chinese cooking, it's ginger, garlic, and scallion, but it's, yeah. it changes throughout every single family. It changes throughout every single recipe. It doesn't have to be this or that. Uh, we, we just do it specifically here for this Got specific it. dish. Um, uh, uh, so in gumbo, traditionally you put one sandwich sausage, but we actually change it up and put Chinese sausage. Ah, so, so I have to sweet sausage. Yeah. For folks who don't know, this is a package of Chinese sausage. I mean, any a lot of Chinese households have this this particular sausage. You can eat it with rice. You can eat it with a lot of different things. But um, it's awesome to kind of see it being incorporated into what you've got going on there. As yeah, you can yeah, see, we have a healthy great. amount of it also. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because um, the andouille, it's you know definitely on the spicier side, and it gives a more sharp taste, but. We found out that this adds a little bit of a sweet taste to it. Yeah. Kind of balances out that, you know, that whole sweet, salty, spicy, you know, sour kind of thing. Um, the next thing is kind of like our spice mix. There's there's no secrets here. Like, I just put some some paprika, garlic powder, onion powder, oregano, and Chinese five spice on there as well. So, yeah, there's no secrets. Chinese five spice guys looks something like this. It's sort of like a brown powdery mixture. And so when you wonder what that five spice is, it's actually cinnamon, fennel seeds, star anise, peppercorn, and cloves. So it's actually a pretty yummy kind of mixture. No, exactly. Yeah. And some people put fennel, some people put something else. I mean, it's again, it's everyone's, you know, different perspective on what Chinese five spice is. And, um, and then also we have four part of it actual okra, right? So gumbo actually means okra, all right? And so that you can't have, my opinion, you can't have gumbo without, without okra. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's me, okay. Can I ask okay. you on, on okra for just a moment? Sometimes it's hard to find. So do you have, you know, is there like a strong opinion about whether you can use frozen okra sometimes because it's so hard to find fresh at times? I'm not gonna say that you shouldn't use frozen okra. I, I mean, I'm, it's one of those things where once it gets blended into the soup, it, it, it takes, it honestly takes a snob to really know the difference. I mean, if, if, you're, if you're just happy to have a, have a hot meal, you're probably not going to have a taste difference. But if if, a gross, if okra's not available, yeah, I think frozen okra is perfectly fine. It's kind of like if you're making a smoothie. I mean, frozen frozen fruit is just, just as good, my personal opinion. So definitely fresh first, but if you're in a pinch, okay. Yeah, if you can get your hands on fresh ingredients, by all means do it. But if you're in an area where it's just not, you, know, you can't get certain things, then you know, you're going to have to uh, improvise a little bit. Absolutely. Sounds good. And then, uh, the other ingredients that uh, we have here is just kind of like a mixture of shallots, garlic, onions, and serrano peppers. You know, to add a little more of a kick to it. And then uh, this is, again, there's really no secrets. We add a little bit of fish sauce on there as well. Mm. Um, all right. Yeah, those are kind of the core ingredients. I'll be adding a little bit of shrimp to be a little bit easier to finish it. And then uh, this is kind of a substitute ingredient. We, uh, instead of using uh, diced tomatoes, we use what's called an uh, IG Amarillo mix, which is kind of you use it for almost saltado. Oh, is yeah. Kind of a Chinese dish. Um, it adds just like another kind of flavor to it, more, um, more of like a bitter, uh, sweeter side. Oh, interesting. That's very cool. Yeah, but that's pretty much it. Uh, oh, I forgot to make a root. You got uh, equal parts flour, equal parts oil. We're using canola oil right here. But you can use you can use vegetable oil. You can use Mexican oil. Um, I probably wouldn't use olive oil, but hey, if you want to, if you want to use it, I'm not going to knock it down. Awesome. So how? So it takes a long time to make make roux, and it takes a long time to kind of put this together, right? Yeah. So we have really really hot burners here. So we can cook at a really, really high heat, and the roux will cook a lot faster. But if you're at home, you know, a lot of times the stove, your stove is not going to be fast enough. So it, it takes a while. So traditionally, you know, when I was visiting uh, 
some of my friends in Louisiana, we, you know, you kind of start the room and then you drink one or two beers, depending on like how fast, you know, you can drink the beers. Um, yeah. I'm not going to do that just yet. I'm not, I kind of, I, I would day drink, but not yet. But, uh, I'm going to hold off on it. Um, that's mainly how you, how you do it. Uh, what's crazy is that in, in the supermarkets now, they actually sell brew already made. So it's, it'll be different, different levels, but because Jumbo is so prevalent there, they have dark brew already, already made. It's kind of, kind of crazy. Um, it's taste wise, it's it's you know, it's it's store bought, so it's never gonna be as good as being home. It it works. It yeah. works. I mean all the gumbo I tried, like see out of like six gumbos I tried, five of them. I mean uh two of them had had the pre made brew. Got it. So if at all possible, make sure you have a beer or two before you start the brew process. <laughs> or wine, whatever. Or wine. <laughs> or your drink of choice. Sounds good. So you know, I'm going to ask you a few more questions about kind of COVID-19 and how that how that's impacting you and how we could support you. But let's see. Let's let's start. Let's see how how this gets put together, how the magic happens. Yeah. So for the same time, I already kind of started the room. So these two ingredients, you kind of just dump it into a, a large pot like this. Okay. And so let's just say I already added it. You know, and, uh, this is kind of what it's looking like right now. As you can see, it's kind of like on the blonde side. And what yeah. we want to do is we want to make this more of a coffee color, chocolate color. Okay, so there's a fine line between burnt and, and, and dark. So that's what we need to do. So you have to continuously stir it. And like I said, you start it, you drink one or two beers or maybe three if you're a fast drinker. And then wow. I kind of just go from there. Do you, is that on high heat or is that on medium? Or yeah, like we put it on really, really high heat, like the highest. But at home, you can do medium. You can do medium and high. Uh, if you don't want to mess it up, you can honestly just put it on very, very low heat. You'll just be stirring forever. Oh, <laughs> then you'll need like you'll need like five beers. <laughs> yeah, which is totally not a problem, especially at these times, right? <laughs> yeah, but you know, just stir, just stir. It'll, this will probably take you know a couple five minutes for us. Yeah. Um, but at home, it could take up to thirty minutes. Yeah. So, so tell me a little bit. You know, um, in terms of how people can support you, it, it sounds like you know, as you're mixing there with your your other hand, you know, a lot of businesses are are going through a pretty tough time, especially with COVID nineteen, because you know you can't have any in store dining. And I know that there's like pickup delivery or delivery right now. So, um, is Paina open for pickup and delivery? What does that look like, and how can people yeah. support you? So, yeah, so we are actually open Tuesday to Sunday, 11 to 9, and then 12 to 9 on Sundays. Um, and, yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, ordering from us would be, would be amazing, uh, specifically curbside pickup, just because yeah. um, some of these companies like DoorDash, I mean, I love the fact that we have them because it gives us customers that can reach on a regular basis. But, yeah, they de definitely do take a specific percentage from it. But uh, yeah, coming by, you know, I know everybody should stay home, but it doesn't, you know, take a little drive, you know, it'll be, it'll be real quick, you know, once you get here. But it's, hey, we're, we're getting, you know, as much as is going on right now with all this COVID-19 and, and all that, you know, it's actually kind of a good thing. We've been quite innovative in what we've been trying to do. So we have, you know, we've been doing party trade, we've been, uh, we're trying to utilize just all our assets in terms of China, just you know, for the most part, stay 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 above right now. You know, yeah. This isn't really a time to, for us to get super super rich. It's more of a time just to survive. And like I yeah. said, you should never go into a restaurant business if you want to get rich. You, know, you should definitely be a, a passionate and a, and a desire. Yeah, I mean, I I would definitely echo that. I mean, there are I mean, most restaurants really do operate on the margin, and you do it because you've got a passion of you know creating and making kind of good food for people to share. And I think. You know, especially with um, where businesses are right now, to the extent that people can, you know, if you if you have the ability to support your local businesses and, and go and buy a meal or two, I think it goes a long way to helping our restaurants stay open because it is it is it is incredibly hard because we are so used to having people dine in. But if people can order order for pickup um, or even delivery, I think that's helpful. But I think as as Jeremy was saying. Um, when it's a when it's a delivery, there's also a fee that gets tacked on top of it from the delivery services, and so that takes away from some of um, the support to local businesses. So to the extent that that you feel comfortable to pick up, I think that's a it's a great suggestion to make. 
And so is there a website that, that you have, Jeremy, that you can point people to in terms of what your menu and offerings are? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, www.mayansf.com is our website. It has uh, all our information, on our, our menus, some of our specials. I mean, obviously, we used to have live entertainment and events here, but because of shelter in place, we can and that would be uh, a place where you can find all that information. Same thing with merchandise. Like, we, uh, uh, we're, we're selling T-shirts, and when we used to sell T-shirts, we actually have a new T-shirt that we're probably going to be selling soon. And that's kind of, like, one of the best ways to support, you know, you don't... Um, and, you know, get from the river. Um, yeah. And then also our, our, our Instagram, our Instagram at Paina SF. That's honestly kind of the best way to kind of stay in touch on, on what's going on. Um, I myself try to update that as, as much as I can. I'm not a big social media person, but, um, you know, it's, so that's, you gotta, that's kind of what I'm doing. And it's linked to Facebook, too. You've got to cook and keep all that stuff up to date. So guys, if, it, if you want and are interested, the website is www.pinasf, so that's spelled P-A-I-N-A-S-F dot com. And so one other thing I think uh, Jeremy mentioned, aside from food, you can also purchase sort of merchandise to support the local business. But one other idea that I've heard um, other people say also is you can buy gift cards. Right. So you can buy, you know, for a friend or anybody else who you think might um, want uh, to try out the, the cool and yummy food. Um, gift cards are also a really good way to go to to support your local businesses. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, gift cards and all that. that that's been helping out a lot. You know, we've got a pretty decent board. Um, if you want to look a little bit closer, actually, the roots on the front. This is kind of like how brown you want it to be a little bit, right? Oh, so awesome. costume stir, right? Yeah. So you actually wanted it to be a little bit darker. Like I said, there's a fine line between burnt and brown, you know, so that's kind of where it is. So it should be ready any second now. Awesome. Wow. Yeah. But <laughs> You've got to pay real close attention to that. Yeah. And be careful. It is really, really hot. So maybe wear some gloves, you know, while you're doing this. <laughs> you're at home. Um, so now, so the room's actually done. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn it to medium heat now. And now what we're going to do is we're going to add our holy trinity. So I see there's a comment from someone, Mars1, who says, love your food. They were supposed to go to Hawaii, but they had to cancel the trip. So this will really help seeing kind of the food that you're making and just remembering that Paina is here is available. Yeah, yeah, you guys can come to Hawaii anytime. You know, we're uh, we're here, we're open Tuesday to Sunday. You know, so. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, so the reason why I turned down the heat is because these vegetables are going to cook really, really fast, you know, so you don't want to burn it. Okay. Um, and obviously, don't forget your salt and pepper. Now we're going to add our spice mix as well. Vinny Boo asks, can we get a cocktail too? <laughs> we, re we recommend, you know, anytime you want to punch up your, your meal, to so go ahead, Boo. Yeah, we honestly can't wait until uh, we can have you guys in our dining room. Because we do have a lot of, you know, signature cocktails here. We recently just started doing um, boba with, with, uh, with alcohol. That's boba? Been, uh, been a hit. So, yeah. Oh, I love boba. And, you know, using the you know, the, the Asian American, you know, kind of thing. Yeah. So you're mixing the Holy Trinity. It's cooking and mixing up with the roux right now, it sounds like. Yep. And it shouldn't take too long. You know, about a couple minutes. You want to just soften it up. Oh, wow. Look at that. Yeah. So your roux is going to act as a thickening agent, and it's also going to act as... You know, the darker it is, kind of a more nutty and more smoky uh, flavor it is, and that's kind of what you want for gumbo. And also the color of it, too. You see how it's, like, really, really dark? Yeah. Um, that's what you want. Yeah, you don't want. You don't really want a light gumbo. After this, what we're going to do is we're going to add our garlic, our shallots, our serranos, and uh, ginger. Yeah, my dad used to say when he was um, a chef that part of, like, the, the – um, cooking was also to make something that was visually pleasing to the eye. 
So you don't kind of want to see like a bland blah, looking color. You kind of like seeing like the vibrancies or like the like the um, browned colors because it's actually in your mind. It, it just looks better. It tastes better to you too eventually. You know. So yeah, yeah. That is pretty important. Especially you know you know Asia is so big and there's so many different flavors and uh, it you know in a way. You know, it's all in the prep, right? Like, you, like when you see, it's like a lot of ingredients. But once it gets started, it's honestly really, really simple. You know, and that's kind of what we try to do here. We try to keep it very, very simple. I mean, I I used to work at um, a couple of fine dining places, and I, I love I loved it. It was great, but you know, it just got to the point where you know, if I need to put everything, I put use every use tweezers, and and it's like five people to a dish. It, you know, it's just not very. I don't we, I don't eat like that every day. You know, and I don't think anybody else does. And so yeah. this is more of like yeah, just very comforting. You can have this every day if you want. It's just like how, like I said, I can have a burrito. I can have a bowl of flour every day. You know, this yeah. is definitely one of those things where you can have every day. Yeah. And well, now we're gonna have our okra. Okra? I definitely don't have a tweezer in my kitchen. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So the okra is in now. The okra kind of gives it that like um kind of like sticky texture. Yeah. Gives it yeah. Gives a little bit of a uh, sticky. Well, I don't want to say sticky. More like a thick texture to it. More of a mouthful. Uh huh. Cool. And not too long, like I said, because you're gonna be you're gonna be cooking this for a couple hours, right? So you can you don't have to cook it too far in the way because it's gonna continue to simmer and it's gonna continue to cook, cook and everything's gonna continue to blend together. Yeah. So the next thing is gonna be instead of our tomatoes, we have our uh, pepper mix. Mm-hmm. So is that um is the ahi mix? It's a it's like a Peruvian thing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So lomo saltado is uh, traditionally a um, Peruvian dish, you know. But the, like a lot of people don't understand that like, there's a lot of Chinese people in Peru. Yeah. And, and so they, in a way, they use this. Uh, so the pepper, I don't know where it's indigenous to. I just know that you know it's 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 put in a uh, Peruvian dish historically, and um, it add, like I said, it adds just like a different flavor to it than your traditional gumbo. Mm -hmm. You let it kind of just let it chill. You're still drinking your beer, you know. <laughs> and, um, about thirty seconds, we're gonna add our stock. Awesome. So we're actually what we're doing is like we we're using specifically chicken stock, but mm -hmm. you can use beef stock. It's totally up to you. All right, like I I like more chicken stock. If you're a vegetarian, you can do a, a vegetable stock. If you're a pescatarian, you can use a a shrimp stock or, or any other kind of fish stuff. Yeah, it kind of just adds like one more layer of flavor to your your whole gumbo, really. Yeah. Here we go. Here's our chicken stock. So, Jeremy, someone is asking if you prepare this gumbo every day, or do you have to order it ahead of time? Um. So this this actually was a special. You know, we we do a, a special from it from time to time. And honest depends on. Because we before uh, shelter in place, we would do a soup of the day. Oh. Wow. So this would be one of them. So we would change it up. We've made, um, you know, one of our staples is oxtail soup. But we made we've made a uh, our own little chicken soup, which is kind of like a chicken pot, you know. So in order to get this week, so we have it available this week. You know, if you guys are if you guys are hungry for this, but usually no, it, it it'd be a special even a special item. Uh, and it also just depends on the rotation of the soups. So, I mean, we we try to get creative. I try to uh, I try to uh, get get my cooks to be a little bit more creative. And same thing with my staff, just to see what's inside. And also, depending on the weather, right? So, if it's really, really hot, you know, I mean, that's a specific type of soup that you want. If it's really really cold, that's another kind of soup that you want. Yeah, very true. So, <laughs> So I'm gonna let this stir for a little bit, and this is when I'm gonna add my Chinese sausage. Ah, so you uh, don't need to have pre-cooked the Chinese sausage because it's gonna simmer in there for a while too. No, 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 because no, no, all the fattiness is gonna just seep into the to the soup itself, okay. and then you know, as it thickens, it's gonna incorporate that flavor. So the thing is, like, you do need to just like a pho broth, you need to skim the fat, you know, once it's once it's going. Yeah. And that's about it. And then with the beauty of uh, 
cooking, you know, we have another batch that's actually ready right over here. Oh, let's you know, take a look. So three hours later. Wow, look at the magic. <laughs> this is like totally. So this is uh, usually around the time. What I'll do is I'll add the fish sauce. Mm -hmm. So is that what it looks like after three hours? And then you start to add the fish sauce at the end? Yeah, this is what it's gonna look like after three hours. Now the beauty about gumbo is gonna it's gonna taste better the next day. So you can kind of just cook this, let it cool down, put it in the fridge, let it do it, let it do its magic, and then uh, the next day it just I can't explain it. It just tastes that much better. Yeah, I know we feel that way about pho sometimes too. When my mother in law makes it. Exactly. So fish sauce for folks who don't know, it's it's um. It's something that's used in like Vietnamese cuisine a lot, um, Thai food a lot, I think. Um, and it's it's a it's actually you can buy the bottles at the supermarket, but it's almost like a very salty kind of um, a condiment, right? So you kind of substitute like as if you were putting salt in in some ways. Is that right? Yeah, it, it just adds a different level of saltiness to it, which I, I love. You know, I I honestly put it on a lot of things when I'm not when I'm not cooking here. And yeah, yeah like. Especially like with, with Vietnamese food, it's just amazing. Same thing with Thai food, it's really, yeah. really good. Yeah, awesome. It's just, it's just like a different, uh, but you know, uh, you know, I, I've heard of some people using, um, what's it called, like soy sauce, you know, that's another thing you can use. I don't, I don't like using it, but you know, other people have used that instead. Yeah, yeah, I really like fish sauce too. It sounds strange, but it's really delicious. So I'm actually gonna fix you guys just one portion right here. Um, kind of make sure it's some sausage in there. And then what I do is I actually use the, I use the, sh I just cook the shrimp in the broth right before it's time to serve. Oh, wow. Yep. So it should take you know, like two or three minutes for, for the uh, shrimp to, to cook. Like I said, once it's pink, yeah, it's it's ready to go. And the shrimp, I peel and we peel into vena here, but you don't have to peel it. You know, you, you know, especially being Chinese, I know that we like to eat shrimp with the shell on. You know, that's yeah. you want to do that. That's totally fine too. We just like to do it here because, um, you know, like we get we get a lot of people from all different types of backgrounds come here. A lot of yeah. times, like it, you know, it just makes it uh, more aesthetic in a way it helps them eat it. Yeah, it's also e it's easier to eat to not have to pull off a shell in the middle of it too. But exactly. up to anybody who's kind of like doing it themselves. Oh my gosh, I see some comments here where people are saying that they put fish sauce on their ice cream. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they, there is a um, there is a fish sauce ice cream that I I have heard of. Um, when I when I was working in Vegas, we we made bacon ice cream, you know, and it's but it, it, I mean the sugar just kind of takes over, right? It, it's it's mainly fish sauce and like a whole lot of sugar you know same thing with the bacon it's just a little bit of bacon and then a whole lot of sugar you're only supposed to get like a hint of that later so, so let me ask you this you know as an asian american you know you've got a restaurant you're you're dealing with covid from like a business owner um have you experienced it in any other way too because i know there's like a lot of i mean um there's a lot in the media about how um you know, Asian Americans are being treated uh, in particular with, with COVID-19 and so on. Do you have any kind of reflections on, on what it's like being an APA, um, you know, in the Bay Area and during this and during this um, pandemic? Yeah, you know, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, specifically being, you know, an Asian American at these times. Uh, you know, it's these type of things that are going on you know, I, I get it. It's been kind of enhanced and blown up since since this pandemic. But you know, this um, non-Asian on Asian crime—it's nothing really new. You know, especially being in the inner city. Like most of my friends growing up were black or Hispanic. You know, and so I definitely got that at, at an early age. And it just, for the most part, it kind of just takes you to start those dialogues and those conversations that you don't want, or for them to somewhat earn your respect for the final part of the truth, right? But going back to what's going on, yeah, I mean, it's, it sucks. It sucks what's going on, but again, it's really nothing new. So what we what can we do to actually mitigate all this, right? It's not going to end. These type of crimes are not going to end, you know? So I think in a way, uh, and just kind of speaking to yourself and other people uh, in the past, like, 
the main thing is just exposure, right? Like maybe, like I said, my I've lived pretty much in most of the country, like a, a lot of parts of the country, and it's not until I come back to San Francisco where I'm not the token anymore. You know, like in, in New York, I'm the token. In, in the Marine Corps, I was the token. In San Diego, I was the token. Um, so maybe in a way, you know, because it, it, it goes on both sides of the coin. Us as Asian Americans, you know, we can probably try not to be too quickish in that sense. Because I know a lot of Asian Americans, like the majority of who they hang out with is just being Asians. I feel like that's one one way to actually get out there and get out off your comfort zone, especially being in San Francisco. And 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 because, like I said, the best thing to do is to kind of just have a conversation with everybody about this. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the more we talk about it, the better we'll feel. But. And, and again, just knowing that none of these crimes, these crimes are not going to end. So we need to figure it out on our own how to, how to not necessarily solve the whole problem, but at least mitigate it to a point where it's not as violent as it actually is. Yeah. I mean, because cause there is, there's a lot of folks who, I mean, they're experiencing it where they're just going about their business, you know, um, walking in their neighborhoods or doing whatever, and sometimes they're being accosted. And it's, I think, no matter where it's happening, it's always shocking when it does happen, especially you think in this day and age that it wouldn't happen. But, you know, especially with kind of how things are going and the way that people are talking about COVID-19 and so, so on, it's something just to be aware of and to make sure that we're kind of supporting each other um, and making sure that we're highlighting the issue because to stay silent on it is also not a good thing. Like we want to make sure people are aware that it's not okay that, um, you know, being being um, xenophobic or kind of just stereotyping even just this this COVID nineteen disease is um, is is wrong. And so I think being able for us to kind of share our stories is good. And I think to your point about being a token in so many of the places that you've been, you know, it's a very different experience for someone who is getting um, you know yelled at or or feeling threatened when they don't have a lot of APAs right next to them. Or you know, it, it feels very different too. And so I think. We all kind of have to just be aware of how we elevate each other's stories and make sure that um, we bring awareness to the issue so that we can try to really um, stop it from happening and really enlist partners to, to help us. You, you mentioned that you grew up with a lot of um, a Latino and African-American friends when you kind of grew up. And I think, like you said, you know, part of it is having a dialogue about, about things and having conversations about like what it means when someone says something to you and it's really uncomfortable to talk about, but maybe that really is kind of the way that it starts is like person to person, friend to friend, having those conversations. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And those, those conversations are really, really important. Um, I mean, like I, I actually had an incident the other day, just walking my dog. And this person, I, I don't want to assume that he was, he was homeless, but he, you know, had some words towards me. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of the things you can either get angry about it or you can kind of, in a way, I found where it kind of helps a little more. Just kind of kill them, kill them with, with, with kindness. Yeah. You know, it's it's it sucks, you know. But we're gonna have to, to fight our bit when it comes to a lot of these things. Just, some people they're just not gonna change their opinion on us. And in a way, you know, definitely just have that plan to just stay calm and be cool. But at the same time, if let's just say they're acting violently in that sense, you know, definitely, you know, be aware. Like I I give my my mom pepper spray. <laughs> and I think I think also you know um, you know to the extent that there are people who are near you and um, bystanders and other folks if you're seeing things like that happen try to try to not ignore what's going on because I think we've heard from a lot of people who have been like accosted that the sometimes the worst part of it is you know no one is stepping in to help you know no one yeah. is kind of like saying hey are you okay do you need anything you know so I don't think that we're suggesting that you put yourself in violence way or that kind of stuff. But I mean, even just acknowledging that something happened, um, I think is sometimes important to reaffirm that what happened wasn't okay. And it, you know, and you're not just gonna let it go. But so, yeah. No, anyway. totally. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, just yeah. back to the plan to the back of the plan. Yeah. So what do we have here? What is it looking like down there? Oh yeah, it's okay. So I'm actually gonna go fix yourself clear. So excuse me for like one second. Okay. All right. Well, see, you guys, I have all of the ingredients to make it, but, you know, I've got to learn from Jeremy about how to put it all together. Ginger, shallot, bay leaves. So all part of, all part of it. We actually got a, 
a little bit of white rice right here that I'm going to smack just right in the plate. Yum. I'm just going to go around the plate a little bit, try not to get too much on the rim. It is lunchtime. I think we're all hungry. You <laughs> uh, guys come by right now for first time. I think it will be ready. Yes, that's actually true. That looks great. Obviously, we're not going to skip you with the shrimp. Yum. Can't forget the Chinese sausage or uh, lap chow. Yeah. That's pretty much what it is. So right here I have some parsley, some green onions, and these are going to be our garnishes. That looks so good. So, the, so you've got a request for someone to said who said bring it closer to the camera so we can see. <laughs> Yum! That looks really great. That looks really good. So for everybody who's watching, if that looks appetizing to you, you know, definitely we're going to share the recipe with you. Jeremy has been he's very generous with sharing his uh, secret recipe with us. We're going to be posting that uh, tomorrow onto our Instagram as well. But I think more than anything, hopefully folks can order. Look, take a bite, take a bite. Let's see what that looks like. Is that good? Very good. Wish you guys. <laughs> Wish you guys were here right now. Mmm, yummy. So for everybody, just remember, if you can support um, our local businesses, it would be just really great to support Paina. Uh, go to their website, www.painasf.com. They're open for pickup and delivery. Um, definitely, if you can help to just come by and pick up, it's, we prefer that only because then there's no kind of service charges that are service charges that are tacked on on top of that. Um, but the other thing is also support them with purchasing merchandise and, you know, even a gift card use. Oh, look, there you go. There you go. We're going to have these for sale uh, real soon. Awesome. Real soon. Uh, little tie-dye shirts. We're all going to back. Awesome. See, yeah, very, very San Francisco. Yeah, this is, uh, this is too small for me, so I yeah, can't wear it right now. <laughs> <laughs> very San Francisco. Well, thank you so much, uh, Chef Jeremy. Anything else you want to say to everybody? No, uh, thank you for this. Uh, happy APA Heritage Month. Uh, again, follow us at PineSF and follow at Carmen2SF. Uh, this was great. Uh, hopefully we can do this again sometime and I'll make something else for you guys. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you.